Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Messner. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar to discuss taking your dispute out of the courtroom and whether mediation is right for you. I just have a couple of housekeeping matters to address before we get started. First of all, because this webinar is only 30 minutes or less, we won't be taking live questions during the webinar today. However, if you do have questions you wish to ask, you can feel free to submit them through the chat button and we will be happy to get back with you uh, after the webinar with an answer to any questions that you may have. And then secondly, this uh, webinar presentation is being recorded today and it will be available on our website later this afternoon if you wish to uh, re-watch it or if you wish to share it with anyone whom you think may have interest in this topic. And so with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, today we're talking about taking your dispute out of the courtroom and whether mediation or some form of alternative dispute resolution is right for you. I'm Lisa Messner. I'm a partner with the law firm of McMurray & Schuster, and I'm the litigation director. I head our litigation practice. My practice is focused on class action defense and the defense of regulatory enforcement uh, actions. In addition, I recently completed the uh, certification through the American Bar Association's Center for Dispute Resolution to become a certified mediator. Uh, disclaimer, uh, we're, we're lawyers, so we would be remiss if we did not um, have some kind of disclaimer for everybody. And so this is just a friendly reminder that the materials that I present during this webinar today are for informational purposes only, and you shouldn't consider them legal advice. Transmission of this information does not create an attorney-client relationship. Just remember that every situation is different and you shouldn't rely on general information within this presentation uh, without for seeking the advice of an attorney to consider your own individual uh, circumstances. So uh, just a little preview of what we are gonna talk about today. We are gonna start with a discussion about what is mediation and, and what is the process like? Um, what to expect during mediation, and how you can best prepare for success in a mediation. And then uh, we'll be discussing how to make the decision about when to mediate and what benefits may uh, be available uh, to you for uh, mediating rather than going through uh, traditional litigation. So we start with one of my favorite quotes and, um, and, and, and somebody who I personally admire, uh, Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. And uh, a great quote that she had was, the courts of this country should not be places where resolution of disputes begin. They should be the places where disputes end after alternative methods of resolving disputes have been considered and tried. And so against those words of wisdom from Justice O'Connor, let's talk about what is mediation. And this is a question I get from many of my clients who have not been through the process before and, and, and just don't really understand exactly what mediation is. And so you start with the premise that mediation is a process that occurs outside of legal proceedings and traditional litigation. And so because it is a process outside of the traditional court system, it's not intended to actually resolve or decide the merits of the party's dispute. Instead, the focus is on a resolution to this dispute through the mediation process that allows the parties to reach a mutually agreeable solution. And so typically in a mediation, the parties will work with an agreed upon third party uh, oftentimes referred to as a neutral, but this person would be a mediator. This person is going to uh, be neutral as to the parties, not have a vested interest in either side, um, and is not called upon to make a decision about the outcome of the merits of the underlying dispute. 
Instead, the mediator would oftentimes be chosen because he or she would have specific subject matter expertise that is relevant to the dispute. So for by way of an example, in a TCPA class action uh, mediation, your mediator would likely be somebody who had either been uh, practicing within that space or had been uh, maybe a previous uh, judge that had heard and adjudicated many of those types of cases. But in any event, that person is going to have specific knowledge related to the subject matter of the underlying dispute. And the reason that this is so important is because the mediator can then have the knowledge and the expertise to be able to advise both parties about the risks that, that they each face in connection with traditional litigation and potential outcomes and pitfalls. So in the mediation process, who participates in the mediation? And so typically it would be uh, the attorneys for each of the parties and then the parties themselves as well as the mediator. Uh, most typically in mediation, all parties in conflict are required to be present. Most mediators would require that an actual decision maker be present at the mediation who can make decisions about things such as um, settlement authority, non-economic components associated with any kind of settlement or things of that nature. Sometimes the parties in conflict might not always be present. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit uh, later on for special circumstances such as in class action cases. As an example, the um, class action uh, named plaintiff might not always be present. And, and again, we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. And so in terms of participating in the mediation, uh, parties are typically reminded that the ultimate goal is a mutually acceptable resolution to the parties. The, the rules in mediation aren't hard and fast, but most typically a mediator is going to um, insist that the parties negotiate in good faith. And so that means that there would not be um, uh, movements, for example, of $1 in a high stakes litigation case, or there wouldn't be any um, permissibility around name calling or um, anything to um, unexcusably um, shame the other side or anything of those nature. You're there to um, present in good faith, to bargain in good faith, and that is most typically something that a mediator will insist on, and it's just to the party's benefits to engage in the process in a meaningful and good faith way. And then just as a reminder, again, the mediator does not decide this dispute and the mediator cannot typically force the parties to agree to any kind of resolution. And I say typically because a good mediator will be skilled and will um, exert a degree of pressure on the parties to try to bridge the parties to a middle point and to try to overcome any kind of impasse that terminates the negotiation. But at the end of the day, the mediator is not a judge. The mediator is not a jury or a fact finder and does not ultimately decide the outcome of the dispute. So another common question, and this is a really good question that I get from my clients and that causes some degree of concern is whether mediation would somehow bind the parties in a way or somehow uh, give um, the opposing side some type of admission or ammunition that could be used against the parties later on in the event a resolution is not reached at mediation and litigation continues. And so that's just simply not the case. First and foremost, me the mediation process is completely confidential. The statements exchanged uh, during mediation are confidential and cannot be used against the parties later on. In some states, there are even statutes uh, that dictate that to be the case. 
a mediation is a voluntary process, it's by consent, and you never are called upon as a party in mediation to reveal anything to the mediator that is revealed to the other side without your consent. And so during the process, if one party wants the mediator to know something so that he or she can understand specifically why that party is negotiating for a certain term or a certain amount, that information revealed to the mediator only may be disclosed to the other side if permitted by the party making the disclosure. If such a disclosure is authorized by the mediator to the opposing party, that cannot in any way be used as evidence or an admission against the opposing party should litigation resume. The results of the mediation are non-binding as far as the court is concerned, except to the extent that the parties reach an agreement. There is no adjudication about which party is right, which party is wrong. There is no determination as to liability. It is a process solely for the purposes of reaching a mutually agreed resolution. Another um, benefit to uh, mediations is that Either party at any time can terminate the negotiation. There is no uh, requirement that parties commit to a certain period of time. If a mediation commences and within the first hour, the parties are very clear that they are um, not going to be able to bridge, bridge their gap, there is uh, no mandatory process that the parties stay uh, present for the mediation, unlike in a traditional court setting where that would not be the case. Again, I mentioned that the, this mediation process is strictly confidential and um, mediators always start at the beginning by reminding the parties of that and uh, confidentiality is a very important and beneficial consideration in mediation to allow the process to work properly. So let's talk a little bit about how the mediation process works. So, um, Pre-COVID, most typically the mediation would take place in person, and so all parties would be present in one location. Sometimes the mediators would bring all parties into one room together to make some type of um, initial opening statement or to convey an initial exchange of demands. Sometimes mediators immediately separate the parties into different rooms and perform what's called shuttle diplomacy, where the mediator would go back and forth between the parties. Whether, whether the parties start together or in separate rooms, eventually the mediator always separates the parties out and speaks to each party uh, individually, one-on-one, -on -one. Sometimes in the context of a mediation, a mediator might pull the attorneys out of the room to um, identify any kind of issues or stumbling blocks that are occurring in connection with bringing the parties closer together. But the ultimate goal is that the mediator would be going back and forth into two separate rooms between the parties to try to assist them with their negotiation and bring the parties somewhere in the middle to where a resolution can be achieved. Post-COVID, and um, it is much more common now, and even as the technology has improved, I would say effective, that mediations are offered via Zoom. A great benefit to the Zoom context for mediation is where parties and their counsel are in different locations. It really bridges a gap that can sometimes be an impediment to mediation scheduling where travel is involved or um, or, or maybe there's scheduling issues. And so I've done several mediations now by Zoom. I find them to be very effective. And typically the format of those involves the mediator um, joining with all the parties at the beginning and then actually connecting virtual breakout rooms. So in within your Zoom meeting, you have a room where all parties are together and then when the mediator separates you out, it, the mediator would break, um, for instance, the plaintiff and the plaintiff's counsel into one breakout room and the defendant and the defendant's counsel into another breakout room. 
And then the mediator has access to both of those breakout rooms to perform that shuttle diplomacy that he or she would perform just as if the parties were all together in one office space. And again, uh, the feedback that I am receiving from uh, the Zoom mediations is that they are very effective. They are very cost savings because of the reduction of travel and that the technology has improved to the point where uh, it really is an effective and cost uh, beneficial platform. So an important consideration in mediation is when to mediate. What is the best time to do it? There's several outside factors that have to be considered about the best timing for a mediation. So the first consideration is whether there's some type of agreement between the parties that requires them to submit to a mediation. And this would also be true of arbitration. I would even go so far as to say that more commonly I see agreements requiring parties to arbitrate rather than mediate. And without digressing too much, arbitration is a little bit different of a alternative dispute resolution process whereby an arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators actually adjudicates and decides the merits of the case. And the mediation is a different process where a mediator is not going to be deciding the merits, but rather to uh, assist the parties in trying to reach an agreed resolution. But in any event, if there is such an agreement or a contract between the parties that require a mediation prior to filing a lawsuit, then the timing for the mediation is determined by contract and that would be prior to any kind of lawsuit being able to be initiated. However, in the absence of such agreement, after a lawsuit has been filed, uh, the timing can depend on a couple of different things. Most federal courts now do require mediation at some point in time in the litigation process. And so if it's by court order, the timing of the mediation is somewhat out of the litigants' hands. However, if it is not by court order or the court order requires mediation by a certain date well enough into the future for litigation to commence, then the timing considerations can come back on to uh, the disputing parties. And so some considerations for uh, litigants in deciding when to mitigate or when to mediate would be um, whether an early mediation makes sense to avoid the costs of litigation, the attorney's fees, the expert witness fees, all of those litigation costs that can mount if that is a benefit to the parties to, to mediate early and avoid those expenses, that is one consideration. Overall client goals is another consideration. Is the goal to, for instance, avoid cost savings like, like we just discussed, mm -hmm. or is there a need for the parties to have some type of information exchange in the litigation process to more fully evaluate the risk and benefits of litigating versus mediating. <clears throat> so another consideration would be your opponent's perspective. And so a mediation is far less likely to be successful if your opponent is very resistant to the idea or if the opponent feels that one of the other factors is weighing in its favor, such as uh, the, the need for discovery, the need for information to evaluate, the need to um, avoid fees could also be something on uh, the, the opponent's consideration. And so you always want to consider your opponent's perspective because if that litigant is not uh, amenable to mediation at the time uh, proposed, then it's far likely uh, to be less successful. So I have a few tips to discuss for uh, maximizing your success of achieving a resolution at mediation. And so first and foremost, preparation is key. In advance of the mediation, the parties want to make sure that any information that needs exchanged 
to, uh, to, to either side is provided. If there is information that one side needs to evaluate uh, the merits of, of its claim, that information is should be provided uh, in advance of mediation so that the mediation process can be uh, more meaningful. Um, being creative, being flexible during the mediation is another important tip for success. Sometimes in mediation, the solution might not always be about money. The non-economic components of, uh, of a resolution can be just as valuable uh, as the economic components. And so I always encourage parties to be creative, uh, think of um, the non-equitable type or, or the, the, uh, the non-economic type of relief that is available that might uh, help the parties bridge their gap. Another key important tip for maximizing success at mediation is to remember the objectivity of the process as opposed to the emotion. And that's not to say that emotion goes out the window during a mediation because the parties in dispute are often going to have some emotion in connection uh, with the underlying dispute. And so hearing those, feeling those emotions, recognizing those and understanding them is important. And it is important that the mediator have that feeling, but it is just as important for the parties to really understand that at the end of the day, the ultimate result of a mediation is to obtain an objective result that is resolving the underlying dispute and bringing finality for, for both sides. Benefits to mediation. There are a lot of benefits to mediation versus traditional litigation if the parties are committed to the process and really wish to bring uh, a resolution to the underlying dispute. First and foremost, the result that the parties control is always the best result. And I've heard mediators say it time and again, I've heard judges say it time and again, and it absolutely resonates as true. In the context of traditional litigation, neither party is in control of the ultimate result. The ultimate result of the case is either going to be determined by a judge or by a jury who comprises of peers not known to the parties. And there are a lot of variables in litigation that can make the result completely uncontrolled or not, not expected at all. Juxtapose that to a mediation. The parties are working together to control the result, to define the result, to make a result that both sides can live with and to avoid the uncertainty that is always present in litigation. For businesses, an important consideration in achieving a controlled result is also the ability to avoid disruption to its business. And those come in multi facets. So disruption to a business occurs by litigation through uh, the discovery process where maybe business representatives have to take time out of the office for things like depositions or to compile documents that respond to discovery requests. Um, if it is a business to business dispute, it can cause um, difficulty with the business's functioning. And so alternative dispute resolution is an, another great way to control the result in order that businesses may be able to bridge their gap and continue operating in business. The cost savings with mediation as opposed to traditional litigation typically are far less. And that's true even if the parties determine that some degree of information exchanged through discovery or otherwise is necessary in order to meaningfully evaluate the case uh, the cost of mediation and achieving an agreed resolution are always going to uh, outweigh the traditional uh, cost of litigating a case through the entirety of uh, motion practice, a trial, an appeal, and all of those things. Another great benefit, and we talked about this earlier, to mediation is that the process is entirely confidential. And so the parties can have a degree of candor with each other during the mediation process that is not present in litigation. 
And that free flow of information and that cloak of confidentiality really allows the parties to meaningfully engage in discussions. The finality that is associated with a mediation is probably the best benefit. You are achieving a controlled result, you are bringing finality to the dispute, and you are ending it in a finite way. <clears throat> and lastly, and we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, more also, but in the context of class action mediation, and my practice focus in large part on class action defense, the benefits to the business can include a very broad release. And so it wraps in all of those components of finality, controlled result, uh, knowing what the back end of an uncertain situation looks like. And so that's another very important benefit that um, I import to my clients as well. And so just a few special considerations to think about for specific types of litigation matters that are considering mediation. So in class actions, as I mentioned, uh, some of the non-economic components to think about are the nature of the very broad release. And to think about some of the specifics of other non-economic components of the settlement, such as uh, the ability to maybe have a reverter of some of the funds that are not claimed, or to donate those to um, a side prey fund for a, for a charity. Uh, the ability to be creative in negotiating a resolution that um, might contemplate the ability for um, the defendant to back out of the settlement if there are too many um, opt-outs, if there's too much exposure left to the defendant. And so those are some great non-economic um, benefits to negotiating a mediation in the class action context. For complex commercial disputes, oftentimes, the non-economic components associated with those are so key to the businesses involved, such as um, the ability to maybe operate or conduct business with one another or with um, competitors or with, um, with suppliers in the future. Those type of non-economic components are uh, so key oftentimes in these very complex commercial disputes for the parties to be able to resolve. In cases involving uh, non-competition agreements, whether in the employment context or in a business-to-business -business context, uh, mediation can account for non-economic components with those types of issues. And so maybe an agreement to an extend a non-compete or terminate a non-compete or to limit a non-compete could be discussed as a non-economic component in mediation. And those types of creative non-economic solutions are typically not available in litigation, particularly in a non-compete context where uh, litigation may be a one-side take all. And then lastly, some considerations for mediating a case involving trade secrets. This would be similar to mediating a case with, um, with any kind of non-compete, but there may be the ability to craft a solution um, non-economically that both sides could live with um, in which uh, there would be some kind of limit to what is trade secrets or some kind of time parameters for the use of them or some type of way for the parties to mutually benefit from the use of them. And so there's all kinds of very creative non-economic ways to achieve resolution through mediation specific to these four categories of cases. And so with that being said, that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation today. I do want to thank everyone so very much uh, for joining me today to hear about this important topic and for the benefits of uh, mediating and considering alter alternative dispute uh, resolution options outside of the courtroom. If anyone has any questions, as mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to submit them through the chat bar, and I will be happy to get back to you um, as soon as I can with answers to your questions. Again, thank you so much for joining me today.